US-Russian relations, what is happening or will happen during the Olympics in Sochi, uh, and uh, several other issues which obviously affect the US-Russian relationship, such as situation in Ukraine and specifically in Kyiv. Because we have uh, a limited time and uh, a high power panel, my introduction will be quite limited. Uh, let me say that we were able uh, to bring people who, from my standpoint, are all outstanding experts, people with reputations for knowledge and objectivity, and they will, as I'm sure you will see that they represent not only somewhat different fields, but also somewhat different viewpoints. We will start with Tom Graham, who is now me managing director at the Kissinger Associates, but uh, Tom also uh, used to be a foreign service officer and was in the Bush White House National Security Council as senior director. Tom, at that time it was called Russian Eurasia, right? No, it was called just Russia. Now it was called just Russia. You never say just. I, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> Bruce Hoffman. Bruce is professor and director of the Center for Security Studies at Georgetown University, uh, and he is a prominent government consultant, public consultant on terrorism, which obviously is a major topic when we are discussing the Sochi Olympics. Uh, Matt Rajansky who was recently appointed director of the Cannon Institute at the Wilson Center, an influential and rightly so expert on Russia. And uh, Matt have spent two months recently in Ukraine, uh, came back from Kiev in June. And last but not least, my colleague Paul Saunders, executive director of the Center for the National Interest. He was at the State Department also during George W. Bush administration. Uh, he was a senior advisor dealing with democracy and global issues. Now, we have a very prominent group of people here, a lot of knowledge, a lot of talent, so I apologize for not introducing everyone, but I will introduce two people from whom I think we will be uh, eager to hear if they will be so moved. Uh, Ambassador of the Russian Federation, Sergei Kislyak. Sergei, thank you so much for being with us. Celeste Wallander, special assistant to the president, and senior director for Russia, and not just Russia, but also Central Asia. <coughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, again, because we have so little time and so much to discuss, I have asked my colleagues to limit their presentations to no more than 10 minutes. Tom. Thank you very much, Dimitri, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, Dimitri asked me to give a, an overview of U.S.-Russian relations. And I have to admit that I hesitate to do that in the presence of Ambassador Kislyak and Celeste Wallander. Now, I think the two of them will tell you that the relationship is fine. Uh, at least that's what they'll tell you in public. And I think it's fine, particularly if you ignore the key issues that are on the global agenda today. The bilateral presidential commission remains in business. It's actively coordinating work uh, on a range of issues from military to military contacts, counterterrorism cooperation, to trade promotion, and people uh, to people exchanges. All very good work, all very necessary work, uh, and much of it uh, uh, going quite well at, at this moment. Now, if you look at the key global issues, I would argue that the, the picture is rather more mixed. On Syria and Iran, the two countries are working together uh, quite actively uh, over the past over the past several weeks, and we look forward to that in the future as well. But the problem is that at this point, at least, we have opposing views of what the desired outcomes are in both the Syrian conflict and how we would deal with the Iranian issue. On Ukraine, which Matt is going to talk about uh, in greater detail, we're engaged in what I would call a sharp geopolitical competition. Just look at the speeches uh, by Secretary Kerry, Minister Lavrov. Uh, the European representatives in Munich over the past weekend. Now, there's one thing that Moscow and Washington agree on, and that is if their side wins, then it's a win-win situation. But if it turns out that its side loses, then we're in a zero-sum competition, and the other side is going to blame uh, the, uh, either Washington or Moscow for being the one that is pursuing the zero-sum competition. 
On the positive side, we both continue to implement the New START. But at the same time, Russia has rejected any further discussions of steep uh, reductions in nuclear weapons. We still face this yawning gap over missile defense. Uh, and just recently, uh, the United States has leaked information uh, that Russia has violated the INF Treaty. And then finally on Sochi. Now, if you read the press in the United States, what we're focused on is corruption, the terrorist threat, and Russia's homophobic policies at home. Everyone says that we want these Olympics to be a success, but the impression created in much of the American press is that we don't want these Olympics to go too well, too well for, uh, for President Putin and what we see as an authoritarian regime. And then finally, and here I'm, I'm sure that uh, the ambassador and Celeste will disagree with me, but looking at this from the outside, uh, I would say it's quite clear that the two presidents don't particularly like one another. Now that's not a problem. Uh, because that doesn't lie at the foundation of relations between any two countries. But it is a problem, I think, that the two presidents don't convey a sufficient amount of respect for one another and that they don't see a particular need to talk to one another on a regular basis about a range of issues. So it's quite clear that today we're on the downside of this cycle of great expectations and profound disappointment that has marked U.S.-Russian relations since the breakup of the Soviet Union a generation ago. Now, some people say we don't need to worry about this because the up cycle will eventually come around. Uh, it's an inevitable part uh, of the process in U.S.-Russian relations. But to me, this time it feels different. It feels different because the downturn has come earlier in Obama's second, second term than it did in either Bush's or Clinton's. It feels different, I would argue, because there are no prominent constituencies in either country that are actively and visibly working to improve their relationship at this point. In fact, what you sense is this lack of energy and enthusiasm uh, in the relationship, as if we're all resigned to the fact that we're going to face a difficult period in relations for some time. Now, it is quite clear that this relationship is no longer a priority for either country. The United States is focused on the Middle East now. We talk about a pivot to Asia. We've got two big trade pacts that are uh, being negotiated at this point in the Atlantic region and the Pacific region. Russia is focused on Europe and Asia. And while the other country is a factor in the relations uh, and in these issues for each of the other countries, it's not the main one in any of the cases. So the energy is gone. The enthusiasm is gone. And there's no agreed new agenda for this relationship, no sense in how we're going to move this relationship forward over the, over the next several years. Now, at some level, this is not surprising. The two countries, in fact, have very different worldviews. We have very different views of what a just world order would look like. We have opposing interpretations of sovereign rights and humanitarian obligations in the current period. And more broadly, we have what I would say are very different interpretations of what the values of our shared European civilization are. On the geopolitical level, more often than not, we find ourselves in conflict, whether it be particularly in the former Soviet Union, uh, but I would argue more broadly, uh, even into the Middle East uh, and South Asia at this point. And then finally, there's someone calling from Moscow already. <laughs> it's not here. <laughs> uh, and finally, both countries are preoccupied with what I would call as a rather painful reassessment of the roles in a world of increasing turbulence. And these differences in worldviews, differences in interpretation of values, different geopolitical interests, and this preoccupation with one's own role is not really a recipe for success in the overall U.S.-Russian relationship. And so what we have at this point, I would argue, is an amalgam of 
legacy issues and current crises. There's nothing uh, on the agenda, nothing in the relationship that is particularly forward-looking, little that is geared towards the change that is taking place in the world and how the two countries are going to cope with that. And without that, without this forward-looking element, we find that the relationship uh, is one that is a mix of competition, cooperation, and indifference. And without this forward-looking element, I would also argue that what we're seeing in this relationship is not necessarily the downside of this cycle of great expectations and profound disappointment, but a new norm in U.S.-Russian relations. This is the way it's going to be for some time. Now, that's not a tragedy. It's not a tragedy because U.S.-Russian relations don't define the international <coughs> order the way they did during the Cold War. It's not a tragedy because I think it is indeed true that the fate of each country does not really hinge on the other, even if it's a factor uh, in, in that fate. What this means, I think, uh, in broad terms, and I'll end on this note, is that this period of great hopes for this relationship, the one that we had worked on for the past 20 years, has really come to an end. Uh, and this is just another marker that the post-Cold War world, uh, for which we had had such great hopes and expectations 20 years ago, has also come to an end, that we're facing a new period in international relations that is going to require new thought, new ideas, new, new creativity for each country, but more importantly for the overall relationship. Tom, thank you very much. It was not a very optimistic presentation, to put it mildly but very informative, and it may has an added advantage of being true. We'll see what the others think. Briss. Thank you, Dimitri. I don't know anything about Russia, so let me say something about uh, terrorism. To some extent, every Olympic Games over the past four decades has had to contend with the risk of, of terrorist attack. In some cases, it's been greater than others. In others, it's been more controlled, but it's been perennially present. Um, I think the reason is fairly straightforward, and I don't have to tell you what it is. We should go back to the person responsible for this preoccupation, and that's someone named Fuad al-Shamali, uh, who was a leader of the Palestinian Fatah movement and one of the architects of the 1972 Olympics Games, uh, one of the architects, sorry, of the attack on the 1972 Munich Olympic Games. And afterwards, when he was asked why his terrorist organization had specifically targeted uh, the Munich Olympics, he gave two uh, explanations, both of which still hold true today and, in fact, may even be more true. The first was he said it was an ideal opportunity to puncture uh, the national pride of the host nation, and certainly the Palestinians set out to do that in 1972, the new Germany, erasing uh, 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 an ugly past by putting, uh, by putting on what was hoped to be very peaceful, enjoyable, spectacular Olympiad, of course, spoiled by, um, the, by the barricade and hostage situation that claimed the lives of 13 Israeli athletes. So that's one reason. Obviously, it's a reason that I'll describe in a second that's present to, in, so, with the Sochi event. Secondly, and just as importantly, is the immense publicity that terrorists can be confident will accrue from, in essence, hijacking a global audience that is tuned in to watch the Olympic Games. 42 years ago, in an era long before uh, the network communications that exist today, according to one estimate, a quarter of the world's population had tuned in in one fashion or one form or another to watch the 1972 Munich Olympic Games. Uh, there were some 6,000 journalists present at that game, at those games. I would argue that today, both those numbers are exponentially larger in terms of the potential global audience and also in the attention that the media will devote to these events. So right there off the bat, you have two reasons why every Olympics has to be especially concerned about security. Why, though, has Sochi uh, attracted this much attention? And I have to say, it's at least in the 40 years that I've been studying terrorism, it's almost remarkable. This is the second event in a week that I've spoken at uh, that deal with uh, the Sochi Olympics, at least to my knowledge. I, 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 I wouldn't claim that I know of every such event in Washington, but it's at least the fourth or the fifth in the past two weeks. So this is an Olympics, I think, for a number of reasons that has received extraordinary attention uh, because of the threat of terrorism. And I think the reasons are obvious and why this threat has to be taken uh, particularly uh, seriously. 
firstly, it's of course uh, Sochi's close geographic proximity to the North Caucasus, which for over a century and a half at least has been a source of recurrent violence, tension, uh, irredentism, separatism, and resistance um, to central uh, government. Secondly, perhaps at least in the history of the Olympics for the past 80 or 90 years, there's been few events that have been this closely associated with a national leader, of course, President Putin, uh, who has apparently a house near Sochi, um, but his, the fact that his personality has been so caught up with this and with the success of these games is another profound reason why it becomes such a, such a stunningly attractive target for the terrorists to attempt to embarrass the president, to attempt to disrupt the games, and not least, as I said earlier, the perennial interest, which was to puncture national pride and also to gain unparalleled uh, publicity. Putting aside anything that President Putin may be responsible for in the Caucasus or in Russia or in surrounding countries, the fact that he remains one of Syria, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's closest, most unrepentant allies, of course, attracts uh, unparalleled animus towards him and additional incentive or motivation on the part of those who may seek to embarrass him or um, reap the publicity. Um, <coughs> the track record of the potential spoilers of this Olympics, in this case, uh, the Caucasus Emirate, uh, that on three occasions uh, since the end of October, have been able to stage successful, increasingly more bloody and uh, violent terrorist acts, not in Sochi itself, but in Vol nearby Volgograd. And this, of course, is one of the main problems that any Olympics always faces. In the United States, we faced the same problem in Atlanta in 1996. The games themselves were buttoned down and were enormously secure. But of course, the problem is securing the periphery, and the periphery in wide, ever widening concentric circles. And of course, the bombing that claimed the lives of one person uh, tragically injured uh, three others in Atlanta in 1996 occurred not at, at an Olympic venue, not within the Olympic village, but just outside. And that, of course, is an enormous problem that the Russian security forces face, not least because terrorists have already struck at a, a nearby um, large city. Terrorism has often been, I think rightly, perhaps even more so today, as a form of theater. And I would say the Olympic Games, from my analysis, this is the second act, which is troubling in its own right. The first act is we've already seen. We're all participants in it here today. The first act was drawing enormous attention to the potential of terrorism to disrupt those games. And that, I think, has really been quite exceptional in this particular Olympics. Um, just the fact that there's so much concern, um, so much attention being focused on the potentiality of the games being disrupted by terrorism has already showered on the persons responsible for those attacks in Volgograd or who want to use the threat of terrorism as a lever for publicity. I mean, I wouldn't say they've already succeeded, but their investment by the way we responded to the threat has uh, started to pay off. I would say also the Sochi Games are the second act because, of course, it's not the only major international event that is going to occur in Sochi in the near future. There'll be the Paralympic Games in March. Um, in 2018, there'll be the FIFA World Cup. Um, so the disruption of the Olympics today, at least in the terrorist perspective, uh, could have enormous knock-on effects as well that will only further uh, embarrass, the, um, em embarrass the president. Uh, geographic elements... The Russian also, president. Sorry, sorry, what did I say? The Russian president. Russian president, Russian president sorry. Um, geographically as well, uh, Sochi, beautiful place, but of course there's a high-speed rail link. There's limited roads, so it provides lots of opportunities to cut those communications, to create enormous disruption, uh, becomes another reason for the attack. And then sort of winding down the list, I, I don't think my news is any better than Tom's was, I have to say, in terms of the why terrorists would be attra attracted to Sochi. Multiplicity of potential adversaries and groups. It's not just the Caucasus Emirate or the Dagestan Vilayet. Um, you have uh, a nearby like-minded uh, Uzbeki groups, uh, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan or the I IJU. You have groups that not only would seek to target the games because of President Putin's policies or to, to embarrass Russia, but also because they buy into an ideology of global jihad, um, where the Caucasus do figure very prominent, prominently. In fact, one of the iconic figures in the jihadi movement is a Saudi named Khattab. Uh, who in the late 1980s, uh, mid-1980s rather, went off uh, to Afghanistan to fight 
against the Russians. In the late 1980s and the early 1990s, he then migrated to the Caucasus, where he fought against the Russians before being killed. And when we talk about the um, jihadi recruitment efforts on the internet, Katab is always a leading figure and is someone that who's portrayed as desirous of emulation and imitation. Uh, and then finally, oh, two, two more things. You also have, I think, the, pos the potential of many Chechens who have already gone to fight in Syria and may yet make their way back, but I think just as worrisome, you have the potential of Westerners, persons with clean passports, as the media might call clean skins, who have also gone to Syria to fight. Um, unfortunately, the, no the numbers from Europe at least creeps up into the thousands. Even in the United States, we haven't been immune. Uh, the recent estimates from the FBI put at least 50 Americans that have gone to fight in Syria. But these are also people that would find potentially the, new, uh, the, um, the Sochi Olympics uh, attractive and might migrate there um, to carry out attacks. And then finally, if the purpose of terrorism is to puncture national pride, to generate publicity, one has to say that one of the third preeminent characteristics or intentions of terrorism is not just to embarrass, not just to generate publicity, but also hopefully to provoke a response in one's enemies that the terrorist feel will somehow prove counterproductive to that country or that government and helpful to the terrorist cause. And when one sees the Russian response, for example, in 2002 to the seizure, again, by caucus, uh, separatists from the Caucasus of the Moscow theater, um, the um, efforts in Beslan in 2004 to rescue the school children and their family that were seized there, you see that these have provoked very harsh, very dramatic responses that may also be exactly within the terrorist <coughs> motivation today to try to compel the Russians to do something that might produce a result similarly bloody um, as both the Moscow Theater and Beslan that the terrorists hope would further embarrass the, uh, the Putin regime, uh, further undermine Russia's success in the games, and also hopefully in their view have these knock-on effects on other events that are going to be held in Russia in the future. Thank you very much. Matt, and <coughs> obviously Ukraine is a very important and complex subject. But it would be particularly interesting for us to hear what do you think about an impact of the Ukrainian crisis on uh, U.S.-Russian relations? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dmitry uh, and, and Paul and Chuck in the center. Um, somehow uh, perplexing to me, you did not find room for me between Henry Kissinger and Senator Paul at your 20th anniversary to say a few complimentary words. So let me just say that uh, the, the fact of everyone around this table uh, you know, Ambassador Kislyak and Celeste and, and, and others who've been mentioned uh, is just testament to the value of, of what you all do. And I'm very uh, perplexed that, that, that I have uh, qualified to be on this panel, but grateful. Um, let me say. Don't be perplexed. Be perplexed that we, I, I was not smart enough to ask you to speak at our anniversary. <laughs> Next time we'll do better. I've seeded the idea. So, uh, <laughs> so, so not only did I, I did this fellowship, it was uh, under a uh, a program called the Title VIII Embassy Policy Specialist, and I, and I worked for the U.S. Embassy in Kiev doing research on corporate rating, which is an enormously important topic uh, in Ukraine, a multi-billion dollar problem for Ukrainians and also for Western companies. I just want to note also that program has now been canceled. Title VIII was, was canceled by the State Department. I think uh, most people uh, who know are on the record saying that's a mistake, and, and I think it's a mistake, especially at a time like this. That should be very obvious. Um, we also, though, have a, a Kennan Institute office in Kiev. Uh, it's not uh, in the Maidan area immediately. It's in Padol, another part of the city. Uh, but we've got about 100 alumni in the country, and for that reason, we've been able to stay very plugged in uh, to what's going on. We're, we're grateful to our alumni who are constantly sending us, uh, you know, interesting articles and blog pieces and, and updates on what's going on. Uh, we've also managed to organize some direct telephone briefings with them, you know, literally feet away from the Maidan. They step off, they get on the phone, and they tell us what's going on. Uh, and I think we may do another one of those soon, so stay tuned. Um, but what I want to tell you guys before turning to the, the impact on the U.S.-Russia relationship uh, is, is kind of just a, a little bit of my understanding of how on earth we got here. Uh, because if you had asked me two months ago, and those who did uh, may disagree with Dimitri about the value of my commentary, I would never 
never have imagined that events would be in the extreme situation that they're in today uh, in Ukraine. Um, so let me sketch out for you, I think, the, the four phases of this movement that we have seen. The first was, of course, from uh, the 23rd of November, uh, when the government indicated that it was going to step off the EU association uh, track, that it would not sign at Vilnius uh, until the 29th of November. And that really was the, the part of this that I would call the Euromaidan. Um, that was when people essentially went out into the streets to say, we disagree with this decision. This is, this is something that should be done. Yanukovych signed the agreement. That was really the demand. And most of the demands at that time, most of the character of what was going on was not so much political. It was not politically partisan. It was not geopolitical in that it was against anyone or even particularly for uh, the EU or the United States. Uh, it was simply about this agreement. It was a promise that had been made and that the people were demanding be fulfilled. Now, had nothing further happened, that protest would very likely, and this is what I said at the time, had basically fizzled after Vilnius. Uh, people would have most likely gone off to the holidays, and we would have had another, perhaps, uh, Timoshenko tent encampment style kind of hollow protest. There's been a Timoshenko tent camp on Khrushchev, the main street in Kiev, for three years, and no one pays any attention to. Uh, that could have but that could have been the fate of the Euromaidan. But what happened instead was on the night of November 30th, uh, the riot police beat up a group of young people who were protesting in the center of the city. And the demand transformed overnight so that the protests the next day and the social media commentary were entirely about that episode and the broader violence of police. And this goes back for many years, but includes, for example, uh, an event that took place last June where a woman was kidnapped uh, and raped and beaten uh, by police and that they basically went unpunished uh, for almost a month uh, and it enraged people. So this became a protest about the abusive use of force by the government and that really ran all the way through the holidays until the middle of last month. Uh, and that was on January 16th when the RADA adopted this set of so-called undemocratic acts, 20 new legislative act, acts which limited all a whole host of basic freedoms, everything from uh, the right to drive in a convoy of more than five cars to the right to gather outside of somebody's house, to the right to simply be on the street uh, dressed in a certain way without permits, all things that in a certain context, uh, certainly in the West, we also require all kinds of uh, permitting and, and put constraints on. But in the context of Ukraine, this was taken to be an incredible mark of disrespect to the people who were in the street, a slap in the face, uh, and very much Yanukovych's turn towards dictatorship and autocracy. And so the demand of the crowd to the extent you can characterize it at that point, uh, the balance shifted to Yanukovych must resign. Uh, and there was a real feeling uh, from everything that, that I've been told uh, that, that some kind of revenge, some kind of justice, some kind of um, uh, accountability for all of this abuse uh, needed to be imposed. And then from the end, towards the end of last month, around the 24th until now, we've been in yet what I would call yet a fourth phase. And that was where, uh, I think to their credit, uh, the government finally responded with, with something, perhaps inadequate, but, but an offer of concessions uh, in exchange for a ceasefire, a willingness to engage in at least serious negotiations uh, with the opposition leadership. And there's, there's a whole lot to say about the relationship of the opposition leadership, and particularly individuals, to the folks who are actually out on the street. They're by no means one-to-one. -one. But the bottom line is the government is at least willing to talk and is willing to make uh, certain kinds of offers. And then, in fact, ultimately, Prime Minister Azarov and with him the entire uh, government underneath President Yanukovych have resigned. So we're clearly in now a fourth and uh, what I hope will be a, a final phase. It is a kind of an end game negotiation phase, uh, but it is by no means uh, simple. And the issues that are on the table are quite enormous. Whether there will be a thoroughgoing amnesty for those who have already clearly been identified as uh, mm -hmm. forefront participants in the protest movement, many of whom have committed violent acts, which are clearly criminal, which could clearly be prosecuted, uh, whether amnesty will extend to figures on the government side, who will form the government, uh, what happens personally to President Yanukovych, because let's not forget the precedent has been set in Ukraine that when you're out of power, you are potentially vulnerable to prosecution and imprisonment, um, and whether, in fact, there will be a bailout from outside of Ukraine, uh, whether the Russian offer will come back on the table, whether the, the funds that have been promised will continue, or whether there will be a new offer from the West. So these are very huge issues, but we're at least in a phase of negotiation right now where violence has declined to some degree. Let me say something about Russian interests, 
what I perceive to be them, uh, what I perceive to be Western and, and U.S. interests, um, and where I think we might be able to go as a result with this relationship. Um, I won't give you a historical lecture about Russia and Ukraine's relations. I teach two classes on that subject um, and could certainly fill an entire semester. Uh, but the bottom line from Russia's perspective is that there is a historical question on the line here, and it's the legitimacy of Russia's place in Ukraine, the idea that uh, Ukraine did not suddenly reinvent itself as a new and different and entirely separate entity after 1991, that in fact not only are there lots of Russian people in Ukraine and have there been historically, uh, but in fact that the legitimacy of the narrative about who we are, the Rus, uh, stems to a very large degree from events uh, and concepts which are rooted in Ukraine and that these two things cannot be artificially severed uh, by geopolitical or political choices. Um, of course, there are church and language, media and family ties, all of which are enormously important. I think in a very genuine way to the Russians, though, you know, obviously there's plenty of manipulation, like on the question of church property. Uh, the Moscow Patriarchate controls some very valuable property, the Kiev Patriarchate, others, and they're constantly trying to maneuver around one another to claim more. Um, there are real financial interests. Russia, as we learned uh, from Mr. Putin not long ago, accounts for uh, more than a third of Ukraine's export and import. And so Putin's position um, was quite powerful and perceived as quite threatening, particularly in the West, but had the virtue of being true. He said to the Ukrainians, if you sign a free trade agreement with the European Union and we continue free trade with you, it will be tantamount to our opening our market to competition from Europe that will damage our economy. Why would we do that? Instead, we will erect trade barriers, and here's what will happen to you. And that's the part that was taken to be a threat, uh, because indeed it was a correct statement that what would have happened to Ukraine would have been economically very difficult, and Ukraine would have needed to be bailed out or protected from that, and the Ukrainians did not get what they wanted in order to protect them in terms of the offer from Brussels. Um, and then, of course, we have the energy relationship. Ukraine is currently working on an energy independence strategy. It may pan out. It may not pan out. I would suggest more likely it will pan out, but at a date far, much farther in the future than the Ukrainians would like to, uh, like to imagine. And what that means is that there will be mutual dependence going forward between Russia and Ukraine. Russia will continue to depend on Ukrainian energy transit, and the Ukrainians will continue to depend for a very substantial portion of industrial and residential power on Russian gas. So the Russian gas discount that was offered in December uh, is in, in fact quite significant. It goes from $400 per thousand cubic meters to 268 uh, per thousand cubic meters and carries the implicit promise that Gazprom will not call in the billions of dollars in unpaid debts. And then, of course, there's a geopolitical interest. That can't be denied. Uh, Ukraine's not moving forward with the European Association Agreement is a powerful <coughs> statement that the entire region will not become the kind of political property of Brussels. Um, and this, I think, for, for Russia, which continues to play the role as an alternate power center, uh, an alternate geopolitical actor, one of several great powers that needs to be consulted, certainly would strengthen Russia's hand, although I don't want to overstell that point. Um, and then lastly, there's domestic politics. And here, I think the events in Ukraine over the past two months actually serve to underscore a point which Putin has been making for many years. And that is, given the choice between uh, perhaps a kind of democratic pluralism, but that comes with chaos, and a more vertical political system that comes with predictability, what would you choose? And the, the same question can be presented to ordinary people as to oligarchs and business leaders. And I think the choice across the board in Russia is likely to be for a more vertical system, less pluralism, but much more order and predictability. And I think every day that the disorder and chaos in Ukraine goes on serves to underscore that argument, which is enormously important in Russian politics. U.S. and Western interests. There's a humanitarian interest, certainly. But the question is, what is the red line? The president announced that there was a red line in Syria that had to do with chemical weapons. Do we have a discrete red line in Ukraine, or are we just generally perturbed? Um, I don't think there's an answer to that question, but we have to remember Ukraine is an enormously large and important European country, uh, and I think it should be a priority uh, for every country that people in that part of the world that are on the, the border of the most developed uh, world regions should not be living in a basket case.
And quite frankly, that's where they are right now. Um, there's a geopolitical uh, component to that. I think it would be extremely damaging to American interests to see uh, any kind of movement towards dissolution of the Ukrainian state. At the same time, a kind of contagion effect. Think about Arab Spring here. The idea that if you can change the outcomes politically, if you can undo the results of the 2010 election in Ukraine, if you can change the composition of power, if you can change Ukraine's geopolitical direction by turning a million people out into the street, you know, one forty-fifth of Ukraine's population, what is the message that that sends, for example, to Belarus, to Russia, Central Asia, Hungary, Greece, or perhaps Turkey? Right? All areas where you would ask the question, you know, can you generate that kind of public outrage? Can you turn people out into the streets uh, if they want something badly enough? And I would suggest the answer is probably yes. So it's a dangerous precedent. Um, economically, I think the biggest reason that the United States is thinking seriously about backing a bailout package for Ukraine right now is a very logical reason, which is if Ukraine uh, accepts that money uh, and follows through on the conditions that come with it in terms of reform, the economic relationship holds enormous promise for the United States and for our European trading partners. You're talking about an extremely large market. You're talking about very effective labor, which is relatively quite cheap and close. Um, and then lastly, there is a geopolitical argument here. Uh, and I think this is different, quite frankly, for the United States and for Europe, in particular for Poland, uh, for the Czech Republic, uh, for Lithuania, for the other sort of new Europe, Central Europe countries. I think there the argument is about, is about space. It's about gaining distance from Russia. It's about bringing Ukraine uh, into a fold or into a, uh, a defensive posture. It's not about NATO, per se, but it's about bringing Ukraine uh, in, into a kind of sphere that helps to protect them from what they still consider to be a threat. I think from the American perspective, it's a little different. It's more abstract. It's the idea that we ought to expand a broader space of stability and democracy in Europe and that uh, moving eastward along the continent and southeastward to some extent makes sense. Um, and it's also about sending a message to other countries in Russia uh, and in Eurasia more broadly that reform is possible. But I would note, again, to my previous point, that the message is losing credibility in the countries where it needs to have it most. And I think that the types of people who are likely at this point to jump on that message and say, boy, this seems like a really good scenario, are not necessarily people that we'd be pleased to have as our allies. So finally, um, what is to be done? Um, look, a lot of people, I, I think that the loudest call right now is for sanctions uh, from the West against Ukrainian leaders. Uh, setting aside all the arguments that I think this group is, knows very well about why sanctions seldom work as a general, <coughs> as a general premise, I'd argue several things. One, uh, sanctions are more likely to be useful when we don't talk about them than when we talk about them endlessly and indeed pass them. I think we want to use them as a tool, a uh, very targeted tool in our discussions with Ukrainian leaders, but we need to be talking to them in the first place. Um, I think if you look at the track record of sanctions in the region, it has tended to be counterproductive. Belarus is, is a good example of that. Um, and I think there's a risk that sanctions backfire in the very immediate short term, because if this scenario goes forward in the direction we don't want to see, which is a state of emergency is declared, the government sends troops out, then sanctions will simply be perceived as a loyalty litmus test. Anybody who has not been sanctioned cannot be trusted. And unfortunately, those are the only people, really, that we are going to be able to talk to, we in the West. So I think imposing a kind of sanctions calculus on the Ukrainian leadership is actually likely to be dangerous. A much smarter play, focus on the upcoming elections, whether they're coming up before February of 2015 or, or not until February. They've got to be clean. That is the one inflection point at which the West clearly has a role in either blessing and anointing uh, those elections and, and their victor uh, or not doing so, withholding recognition. That's something that even Yanukovych is going to need, and that gives us leverage to insist on clean elections. I think making the EU association pathway as appealing as possible, and I think that the, the U.S. government, uh, as well as the Europeans, seem to be, since Munich, moving in this direction, that is coming up with an actual financial support package with the right anti-corruption and reform conditions attached to it. Um, this one astonishes me at how difficult it seems to be, but opening the doors to Ukrainian student, work, tourist, and other visas. Right, almost done. Uh, and, and the simple message here is ordinary people need to understand much more substantively what is it that they're losing? What is the opportunity that they're missing by not engaging 
uh, in a more serious reform process. They need to see it in action in Western societies, and the statistics on Ukraine are still uh, unbelievably anemic in terms of the tiny numbers of people who, who travel to the West. And then finally, this is my last plea to, to echo what Tom said, we have to talk to the people who hold the cards. And that doesn't just mean having kind of empty interactions with Yanukovych and his emissaries. It means we've got to talk to the oligarchs. It means we have to talk to our Russian counterparts. Let me put it this way. We are far more likely to run out of attention for this region long before those players run out of resources, because it is infinitely more important to them than it is for us in our political process. And I think we have to be realistic about that. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> And then we will uh, we'll try to stop somebody from the U.S. government, because we know that particularly under President Obama, uh, the U.S. government is not easy to stop. Paul, but you're from the center. Right, 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 right. I'll, I'll be very easy to stop. Um, you know. One of the principal reasons that governments compete and spend so much money uh, to get the Olympics in their countries is, is that they want a lot of attention. And uh, clearly, governments make a calculation uh, that it's mostly going to be positive attention and it's going to be worth it, and it's going to be worth, in Russia's case, you know, the $50 billion uh, that uh, uh, we've heard has been spent. Uh, in Russia's case, uh, uh, actually, if you set aside the United States and the West, uh, it, it looks like that may well have been a very good investment. Uh, Russia's uh, uh, Ambassador Yuri Ushakov, who's President Putin's top uh, foreign policy aide, uh, has said in the media that 60 heads of state or, or government uh, are coming to Sochi. You know, taking into account that there are only 85 countries that are participating in the Winter Olympics, you know, 60 out of 85 is uh, actually rather a lot. Uh, and what I think it really highlights is a, uh, a gap, uh, perhaps, in how the United States and the West uh, look at Russia and how many other countries around the world uh, look at Russia. Uh, and uh, uh, the kinds of attention that the United States and Western countries give to Russia and the kinds of attention uh, that, that Russia gets uh, elsewhere. Uh, my mandate is, is to, on this panel is to talk specifically uh, about human rights. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's very clear uh, that Russia's human rights practices get much more attention. Uh, in the United States and the West uh, than they do elsewhere. Uh, in the case of this particular Olympic Games, uh, the issue of gay rights uh, has gotten enormous uh, attention uh, in the United States uh, and the Western media, and I think it starkly illustrates uh, some of these differences. And I want to talk uh, uh, about that uh, for a few minutes. Uh, I, I don't approve of uh, Russia's so-called gay propaganda law, uh, and uh, I have a lot of other uh, reservations uh, about Russia's human rights practices. Uh, that being said, you know, w when you look at Russian public opinion, uh, uh, you know, the attitudes of people in Russian society on these issues, uh, it, it should hardly be surprising uh, that the political system would produce uh, the laws that it's produced. Uh, Eighty-two percent of people in Russia are opposed to regular gay pride parades in their cities. Seventy-seven percent of people in Russia are opposed to same-sex marriage. Forty percent of people in Russia believe that uh, uh, gays and lesbians should have fewer rights uh, than others. 22 percent uh, would support criminal prosecution. So it's, uh, uh, it, it's that environment uh, in which this legislation comes forward. Uh, and if you look at the, the law, uh, it, it's been uh, very broadly supported within Russia uh, and actually, I, I think, managed to 
capture the 80 percent plus uh, uh, share of r the Russian population uh, who uh, uh, I, I guess are happy watching parades of tanks but uh, less happy watching uh, gay pride parades. Uh, uh, without, on the other hand, you know, reversing Russia's post-Soviet uh, decriminalization uh, of homosexual conduct, and you know, remembering that 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 is criminal conduct in a very large part of the world, uh, including uh, in India, which you know we frequently talk about uh, as the world's largest democracy. Uh, now, uh, if you look. Uh, well, let me actually skip, in the interest of time, talking specifically about the law. We can talk more about the law if people have questions about that. Uh, certainly, though, uh, when you look at public opinion uh, and also at, at legislation, uh, you know, you find that Russia falls actually somewhere in between uh, the United States and the West uh, on one hand and uh, uh, particularly the Middle East and Africa, uh, on the other hand, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of public attitudes. And uh, 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 again, uh, uh, I don't think it's too, uh, it, it's too surprising that Russia's legislation should follow Russia's public opinion. Uh, what I think is uh, uh, you know I an interesting question, at least for me, is a very interesting question, is why when we look at Russia and we look at other countries in the world, uh, why we focus on these issues in, in different ways. And you know, Celeste is here, and I'm sure Celeste would tell us that this is a major priority for the administration, and it's one that is uh, universally applied. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I expect from a certain perspective uh, that that's true. Uh, but when you look at the very large number of relationships around the world uh, that the United States has, uh, this is an issue that has uh, particularly come to the fore uh, in the case of Russia, uh, and uh, uh, certainly not only on the part of the administration, but also on the part of the, uh, uh, the media. And why is that? And I think, for me, uh, it gets back in many ways to an issue I think that, that Tom raised uh, about our real uncertainty, actually, about where Russia fits. You know, is Russia part of the West and part of Western civilization, uh, or, uh, or isn't it? Uh, and I think there's a, a, a very uh, strong temptation uh, on some issues to see Russia as outside of the West. In other areas, there's a strong temptation to see Russia inside the West. And when we look at Russia and see a, a Russia that we want to be inside Western civilization, and then we see uh, uh, conduct by the government, human rights practices, other things uh, that don't line up. Uh, it, I, I think it's especially frustrating for many people. It's like an itch that you just need to keep, uh, keep scratching. Uh, that, that, that's the best I've been able to come up with in, uh, in long reflection uh, on that particular issue. Now, looking concretely uh, at the Olympics, you know, the climate that has emerged uh, around this set of issues and the, certainly the very widespread uh, concern uh, about Russia's uh, treatment of uh, uh, its gay and lesbian citizens and about the law uh, certainly makes it seem uh, uh, likely uh, that some people in Sochi may try to express their views uh, on that issue, whether they be athletes or, uh, or spectators or, uh, or others. Uh, now, athletes are in a very uh, particular situation, and uh, uh, it, I think it's going to be more challenging for many of them to uh, e express their views openly, first and foremost, because of the Olympic Charter, uh, which is very clear in prohibiting athletes from taking part in demonstrations or uh, other political activity uh, during the Olympics. Uh, 
um, a, a actually uh, a modification that was introduced uh, to the charter from what I understand a, a, at the strong uh, uh, initiative of the United States during the Cold War period. Uh, but, you know, spectators also uh, will be in, I, I think, a somewhat challenging situation uh, in expressing their views. Uh, and, and this connects a little bit to what Bruce was talking about. You know, here you've got Sochi inside this ring of steel uh, with tens of thousands of armed security officers uh, distributed trying to protect everyone uh, from, and very importantly, uh, from a real uh, risk of terrorism. Uh, and uh, uh, are, is this force uh, that has been assembled and trained uh, for that purpose uh, going to be uh, uh, the, the best possible force uh, in dealing with protests uh, that, that may come up? Uh, I, I think that's something uh, certainly to, uh, to be concerned about uh, as the games go onward, and you know, we'll have to see uh, what happens. Uh, certainly the Russian government, I'm sure, is trying uh, uh, its very best not only to avoid terrorism, but also to create uh, an environment in the spirit of the attention that's coming to Russia uh, that, that's going to create the best image for Russia. And I'm sure the Russian government will try very hard to ensure that everything uh, uh, goes off uh, without a hitch and without major incident. Uh, but it's a very complicated mix uh, of pressures that will be brought to bear uh, at, at these Olympic venues. Uh, and something for us, again, to watch very close, uh, closely in the weeks ahead. <coughs> Paul, thank you very much. <coughs> As I was listening to these presentations, which to any, I think, objective observer would not sound excessively optimistic. I actually felt that perhaps we were still too optimistic. And I would go to uh, a point made by Tom Graham at the beginning, that what is happening now between Russia and the United States may be a new norm. Well, the basic question is, can you sit still on a bicycle? And can you sit still on a bicycle indefinitely? Particularly in a situation when there are so many pressures to move in some direction. Uh, and uh, Graham Allison, who many of you know, uh, just had a terrific piece uh, in the National Interest where uh, he talked about the history of great uh, power relations when you would have one status quo power and one uh, rising power. And he looked at 15 cases during the last 15, 500 years. And uh, he came to a conclusion that out of these 15 cases, 11 have resulted in a war. I have decided to do something different. I have tried to look uh, to the best of uh, my ability uh, at cases of uh, relations between major powers starting with the ancient Greece. And I looked at cases when you would have a status quo power, uh, which, however, in fact, is not a status quo power, but is in reality a revolutionary power, and another revolutionary revisionist power. In my analysis, all these cases, without a single exception, have resulted in a war. And as we were talking about Ukraine, I think it's difficult to uh, claim that the US and the European Union conduct in the case of Ukraine is a conduct of a status quo power. And that certainly is not a way it is being seen in Moscow. Uh, as Big Grzynski said quite correctly, that without Ukraine, Russia cannot be uh, an empire. I think that few Russians, however, would be thinking in those terms. I think that they would probably say uh, what Peter the Great said uh, when uh, uh, 
there was a Swedish invasion of Ukraine, uh, and uh, there was a real possibility because some Ukrainian Cossacks decided to support the Swedes. Peter the Great said that if we allow Ukraine to go and to be dominated by another foreign power, he said that would be the end of Russia itself. That's how the stakes are being perceived uh, by uh, uh, many in Russia. And I think uh, since it is uh, 2014, we are uh, 100 years away from World War I, we have to be very careful uh, uh, not to assume that since we don't want something, nothing is going to happen. <coughs> And uh, my uh, concern is not about Russia per se, because Russia, of course, is not a superpower it used to be, and President Putin, I think, is the first to acknowledge that. My concern is different. And I will be now very simplistic because we don't have enough time and because we have a lot of, a lot of things to discuss. But let me just say, let's imagine that China today is uh, Germany under Kaiser Wilhelm. Clearly a rising power with considerable ambition. And let's imagine that Russia, well, I don't want to uh, offend my Russian friends, Russia is a little bit like Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, not quite, obviously, because it is not <coughs> in real decline and because it has nuclear weapons and because it had considerable economic success during recent years. Uh, not recently, but uh, through the bulk of the Putin rule. But still, uh, Russia clearly feels insecure on, on its periphery, the way uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was in the Balkans. And when you have a serious power like Russia, and I don't think anybody questions that Russia remains a serious power, uh, when they feel insecure in the very periphery, and they believe <coughs> that people think that they can do whatever without Russia being able to respond, that creates a very dangerous dynamic, particularly when you have another great power like China, which also seems to feel that it is being subjected to containment. I think we have to uh, be aware of the general geopolitical context when we are thinking about the U.S.-Russian relationship. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, it happens in a situation when there are many forces in the world which are working against American interests. And I think that we have to be uh, very careful in defining American priorities and deciding which geopolitical ventures we should be prepared to pursue. And I am in this case talking about Ukraine. And we should try to do something very un-American, namely not just to ask what we're entitled to do because we're inherently morally right, but we should ask where we're going to be if uh, the other side would respond not in a way we like. On that, even more unhappy note, uh, Ambassador Kislyak, could we persuade you to make a brief comment? A couple of points. Sydney, I do not have time to respond to each and every one. Please don't. No. <laughs> then I would manipul uh, monopolize uh, the whole debate. Uh, but there are several things that are ultimately utterly disappointing. In this debate, like the rest of the debate about Russia, in this country that I'm witnessing, participating. And I will start with the Olympics because it's very much on the mind of people. And on Friday, I hope we will start a wonderful uh, event that is going to be a high day for sportsmen, for friendship, uh, and uh, it's going to be successful. But Tom uh, was suggesting that three characteristics that are very interesting to Americans about the Olympics, it's corruption, terrorism, homophobic, uh, quote, unquote, Russia. What about the uh, American uh, sporting team? Is it of any interest in the United States, how it's going to fare at the Olympics? 
I haven't heard it. As if the whole Olympics is about American attempt to uh, redo Russia the way you want. You seem to have forgotten that Olympics is about the kids that go to compete, who will enjoy culture exchanges, who will enjoy living together and enjoying partnerships and friendship there. And <coughs> being here and each and every day listening to the same debate, I'm utterly disappointed uh, that American thinkers seem to have lost the uh, remembrance of what the Olympics are about, what the charter is about. And it is three points. Corruption, give me uh, evidence of the corruption. Putin and Medvedev have raised this so many times. The only argument that I have heard in this country about alleged corruption in Russia is that it's expensive. Yes, it's expensive. But you know why? Something that our American friends never care to look into. But for us, Olympics, it's not just an event of two weeks where a lot of uh, visitors will come. For us, Olympics is pretty unique an opportunity to encourage investment into region that have been fantastically uh, attractive in terms of its geographics, its climate, environment, but didn't see a lot of modern investment. It's very outdated. And uh, look at the map. Russia doesn't enjoy too many uh, areas in within its own territory with access to uh, warm sea. Sochi plus 700 kilometers to the south and the north, it's about it. Because in the Soviet Union, uh, it was much larger. We, that included Crimea and Georgia. Currently, it's different. And we wanted Russians to have a chance to go to enjoy sports, to enjoy a uh, warm sea within the perimeters of its own country. We also want uh, Russian Olympic teams, national teams, to have a training ground that sometimes also is not available. There, it's not a secret that sometimes our sportsmen would go to <coughs> Austria or elsewhere to train for international competitions. The secondary, uh, and I would say that Olympics uh, is going to be a big event, uh, but in two weeks it's going to be over. But all the infrastructure that had been created is going to stay. It's going to stay for our people to enjoy. And I would also add to out of this uh, money that were invested in the whole project, the government paid less than half. The rest of it, it's a business. And business certainly doesn't invest unless they understand how to recover money. They have built additional 40,000 rooms capacity of hotel. All of this is going to be available for people who want to join the place. And I've never heard anybody looking into this. On top of that, uh, we enjoy leadership now in Russia. That all of them are good sportsmen. And my president uh, is one of them. And he wanted to use the Olympics in order to generate more interest among youngsters in Russia in sports. The, spor uh, the, the style life that will, uh, lifestyle that will be more healthy. And it's also an important event internally. You all seem to have uh, discussed the importance of Olympics for Russia in terms of Russia making a case about its importance. It's somewhere on the screens, but it's much more for us than just the power play or uh, positioning uh, ourselves uh, on the world arena. Secondly, terrorism. I've been listening to all the debate about the dangers uh, in, alleged dangers uh, in Sochi. If people think that we do not understand it, we certainly do. We understood it from day one. And uh, I think those who uh, accorded the right for Russia to have this Olympics understood it from day one as well. And we do it with absolutely open eyes. We have uh, invested a lot in ensuring that it's safe uh, games and that uh, any terrorist attack or uh, even uh, plot to, do, to have it is going to be uh, 
uh, thwarted, and we will deny a, any chance to them. I'm absolutely certain about having learned how it's been organized. But is it pretty unique to Sochi? The majority of discussions on this issue here in this country uh, sounds like uh, it's only in Sochi that is happening. And elsewhere in the world, uh, it's almost non-existent. Look at the preparations of the Super Bowl the other day. If you count the number of law enforcement protecting and Air Force covering it, uh, in terms of number of people they were protecting, most probably the intensity of these efforts here was even much higher. Why? Because the United States are concerned about possible threat of terrorism in this country. And we understand it. But you didn't decide to cancel the uh, Super Bowl because it's an uh, event for people to enjoy sports, enjoy life. It's a popular event. And it's wonderful that you take measures to deny a chance for terrorists to undermine that kind of event. We do the same, and we are going to succeed. Homophobic. Uh, something that I'm listening and uh, very much disappointed because it's kind of a non-issue because nobody is going to uh, be discriminated against uh, on uh, any basis, including on their sexual orientation. The Russians' law do not prohibit any type of relations. The only thing that is prohibited is to try to teach uh, a different lifestyle, uh, the minors who haven't yet grown to take their own well-informed decisions. And that's it. And in terms of uh, the uh, behavior of sportsmen, I think that Paul <coughs> was absolutely right, suggesting that the, U the Olympic Charter explicitly prohibits, uh, I think it's paragraph 51, any propaganda. Uh, and there is even an explanation as what uh, might be the pu Olympic punishment. It's not Russian law, it's Olympic Charter that says so. And also what is important to remember that when Olympics go to a place, to a country, they also need to respect the laws of the country and certainly to show respect to the views of the people who live there. So I'm, I'm pretty relaxed uh, about this issue because to, to, uh, to me, uh, it's almost no issue has, that has been blown out of proportion. And I enjoyed reading yesterday something that I had been telling my American friends all along that before teaching us, before teaching us uh, these laws, look at the legislations in a number of American states, especially in the South. You will see that our legislation is so mild compared with yours in this state, that there is a question, political question, as to why this country or some others try to teach us something that they cannot accept on a universal basis within parameters of their own country. In terms of the quality of Russian-American relations in general, I understand I'm taking too much of your time. I will uh, finish soon. Uh, Tom said that uh, most probably the new characteristics of these relations that we've lost interest to each other. I, I, I cannot agree with that uh, to the full extent, uh, but I would agree that we lost uh, an interest in each other as an existential threat. Whether I miss that kind of sent uh, sentiment or not, I don't. And uh, there is a kind of vacuum, in a way, in trying to define what is the new content of these relations. There is a very easy uh, tendency to define the Russian-American relations in terms of our disagreements over uh, regional crises or something else. Uh, but apart from the international crises where we work together, we do not agree uh, on the best outcome, we have bilateral relations. Nobody remembers of it. And uh, they are not yet developed to the extent that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we could have had. We would have worked a little bit differently, not only on the international agenda where we all play a role, but on strictly bilateral relations. The trade between two of us is still minuscule. 
the contacts between uh, our legislators are almost uh, non-existent. The dialogue between the societies are very, very uh, um, limited. However, we no longer force, and I'm certain, certain in this, there is no basis for the resurrection of the Cold War, and it's something, uh, the Cold War, that I do not miss. But we are yet to establish a more positive agenda that will bring our countries together, not only working on the crises, but in terms of bilateral relations. And I'm glad that the presidents, both presidents, uh, want these relations to develop. They want economic relations to become more prominent part of these relations. And I hope we will see some uh, steps by the two governments in order to promote it. So what I'm suggesting is that uh, the relations are changing, uh, but in the long run, I'm not sure that they are changing to the worse. They are going to change to the better. But it will take time, and uh, I, I shouldn't expect the uh, relations to change positively overnight. We will have to work on it. But we will be working more and more on positive agenda than uh, on the things that uh, were uh, related to mutually uh, the mutual threat of annihilation. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, for this very informative presentation, but particularly for a note of optimism around this, this table, which was our first today. Celeste Wallander, any optimism from you? So um, I would be inclined to just say I'd rather hear the discussion, but then you think I'll duck, I'm ducking. Um, so I will just say less than 60 se seconds worth of comments. Um, and thank you to the panelists for a great uh, conversation and, and to Ambassador Kislyak for laying out so many points um, from his perspective. It really is helpful and interesting and important. Um, and I'm mo mostly going to I'm going to disagree on two points with Tom or clarify, correct, two points that I think are important. Number one is on Syria and Iran. Actually, I think it's the exact opposite of uh, you po pose the problem, which is it's not that the United States and Russia disagree on the outcomes. We actually agree on the outcomes in each of the cases. Where we disagree and where the challenge has been in both cases was how you get to those outcomes. And that's where all the diplomacy <laughs> and the negotiations and the meetings are focused. We agree on, in Iran, without a nuclear weapons program and a nuclear, a peaceful uh, nuclear program that is under appropriate international <coughs> law, monitoring, so on and so on. We agree on that. We just have different views about how you get to that, but we've worked out a common approach, which we're now implementing. And on Syria, similarly, we agree that we want Syria with a government that is answerable, accountable to its own people. We agree that that can only be uh, reached ultimately through a political process, through negotiation and a political process. Um, and we agree that we do not want Syria to be, be an environment in which extremism is fomented and able to operate, threatening not only the people of Syria, but also Syria's neighbors. Where we've struggled is finding a common approach in how to get there. But again, right now we're in a place where we are finding those ways forward, partly because we have that responsibility to the international community. Ukraine, I take the point about U.S. and Russia talking together because we need to find, I think we probably, although we haven't talked about it, agree that we, have a com we maybe have more common interests right now apparent in what we don't want, which is a violent breakdown in the country, the loss of the capability of the political institutions of the Ukrainian state to be able to function, um, and a complete meltdown of the Ukrainian economy. And so I guess the challenge is from those, what I think, I won't speak, but for, for Russia, probably common interests in Ukraine, can we find a way forward towards those? And it's a, it's a good challenge. And the last point I'll make to clarify is that while maybe some commentators who are in civil society in the media or think tanks uh, might ri want Russia to have a less than successful um, Sochi Olympics, there is absolutely no question whatsoever that what President Obama wants is for a successful, safe, a uh, wonderful display of the best of what the Olympic spirit is about, and we have offered whatever help we can um, offer to the Russian government, which is responsible itself 
for the conduct of the Olympics um, and that we have worked very hard. Um, in fact, I almost couldn't come to the lunch today because we're still working hard to, to achieve that outcome. So I want, thanks for the opportunity to clarify. There's no question on that. Thank you. I have one specific question to you. Security procedures in the Olympics. Uh, was the U.S. government able to get any role for uh, American personnel, at least as far as protecting of the American team is concerned? So um, I'll, I'll repeat, the host country is always responsible for security for the Olympics, and we res respect that Russia is responsible. We have received the kinds of accreditations, extra accreditations and extra presence um, for um, U.S. liaison officers, and we have received on the ground support and close contact with Russian security officials. So um, the coordination is going quite well, um, and is within it is within what you would expect from a host country offering to a guest country participating in the Olympics. Thank you very much, and we know how busy you are, particularly on the eve of the Olympics, and I'm very grateful that you found the time. And we understand how sensitive uh, the situation is, so we're particularly appreciative that you're willing to comment. Now the floor is